Okay, starting in three, two, one. It sounds we like to give a broad-based response to OG, firstly in pointing out that there are a lots of social narratives that exist in status quo and exist in the world that make uh, a lot of sort of negative forms of pride, a lot of forms of pride that harm other people, make the like highly disincentivized, right? There are social narratives that heavily reduce and mitigate these certain forms of pride. I also think that there are like implicit narratives like that address a lot of the first argument that there are groups who can't feel pride because of how they are in society. Firstly, I'd like to point out that like LGBT people, like black people, some of the most marginalized people in society, precisely because of their marginalization, often feel the most pride in their identities and in what they are and who they and like what they do and who they are. I think therefore um, that there is a lot of implicit rebuttal to that throughout my speech. Firstly, on our main point, then, I think that pride is crucial to self-actualization and to the feedback loop, which makes you feel good about yourself, your actions and your achievements, without which I think that just makes you feel really, really shit about your life and without a sense of innate good and purpose about things that you want to be doing. I think that firstly, in terms of talking about that self-actualization loop. I think what qualities are there in self-actualization other than pride? I think the self-actualization looks like wanting to improve in a certain like activity or something that you're doing. It looks like having the self-belief that you can improve. And it looks like the belief and knowledge that you can have an effect on the world that is crucial to self-actualization. But in a world in which all these three things are true, but which you have no pride, this is still pretty shit, right? Because the feedback loop is broken. The pride fulfills the feedback loop of self-actualization because through in this manner, right? I think that when you have a certain goal or intention, when you strive to achieve that goal or intention, and when you have an effect on the world, the result of pride and the effect of pride in your day-to-day -day activities, regardless of what you're doing, is that you feel good, that you feel pride in the thing that you've achieved, that you feel the thing you've achieved is important, and you feel the thing that you've achieved is good, that you've made a difference to the world, and you can feel good about doing that in and of yourself. I think this is a crucial part of the self-actualization loop because without that, the dopamine that you would have released, you no longer have access to. You no longer get that positive feedback when you do things that you should feel good about. I think that this this is quite crucial, right? I think that this can be exemplified. I'll exemplify that more clearly later on. But at least for the moment, I'd like to point out that without pride, in terms of just more specific uh, characterization, Without pride, people like charity workers, people who work in soup kitchens, people who are volunteers in soup kitchens, without pride, often will feel like they aren't doing as good work as they would with pride, right? They feel like cogs in the machine. This is for two reasons. One is because when you don't recognize the importance of what you are doing, when you feel like the thing that you are doing would have gone on without you, i.e. you don't recognize your own self-importance to the thing that you're doing. As a nurse, as a charity worker, as a soup kitchen volunteer, you feel like that patient would have been cured anyway. You feel like that soup kitchen would have gone on and served the same number of people regardless. You feel like your charity would have continued to do about the same amount of work anyway. Maybe you still think that you're doing a good thing. Maybe. Uh, maybe you still like you know want to improve. Maybe you still have to earn there for money. It's not like it doesn't necessarily happen. It's just that you feel really a lot less good about doing it, right? Because if you don't feel like you're, oh, you're important, you don't feel like you're making a difference in the world, th then this is a massive, massive harm to you, your self-importance, and what you want to do on in the future. But the second reason of that is that not only do you have to recognize your own importance, but when you recognize that you feel pride in the fact that you're doing something that is good and doing something that is positive, you feel a positive reinforcement about yourself and your own character as being someone that is good, being someone that is worthwhile, and being someone that is having a positive impact on the world. I think that even when you achieve things on on their on gov side of the hat you no longer feel good about the things that you do and things that begin to feel hollow this looks like playing a board game and cheating at that board game to beat your family members you no longer feel a sense of pride in actually having won that board game anymore right because you don't feel like it's down to your own sense of achievements you don't feel pride in having done it you just feel like you've won and sure you might get a bit of like a tiny like thrill from other people saying oh you did a good job you played well maybe but you're not going to feel the pride in the fact that your own achievements your own qualities and your own beliefs beliefs brought about the thing that you wanted to achieve. This is also looks like university, right? Why a lot of people criticize things like legacy admissions or diversity quotas. Because when you get into university, when you get into a prestigious university, solely because your parents went there, solely because you're on a, to fulfill a diversity quota, solely because you're good at sport, you don't necessarily, that's probably a less good example, but still probably true in that case, but more true with the other two. I, I think that when you get into a university, that a high quality university as a result of something that is not 
down to your own self and your own achievements and your own self-worth, you feel less pride in doing it. It doesn't feel like as big of a good thing that you've done. It doesn't feel like you've worked hard and strived to achieve this because it wasn't entirely down to you. You no longer feel pride. These are the kinds of emotions that people are going to feel with every single thing that they strive to achieve in their lives and in society. And this is just a massive negative harm. I think that pride is instrumental to living a positive, meaningful life, because where your positive qualities make you feel good and confident about yourself and your achievements, without pride, everything feels empty and hollow. The things you do, the things you achieve, weren't because of the fact that you like are good, weren't because of your own innate qualities. You just do an out an action. And without having that self-belief, without having a feeling that the action was achieved because you worked hard or because you're a hard worker or that because you have an innate sense of being intelligent, it's just the expected outcome because you don't haven't striven to like you haven't strived beyond the place that you're expected to go. It's just the expected outcome. You feel nothing. And I'm not necessarily trying to access any sort of broad societal changes or, yeah, sure. Yeah, pride is about having an excessively high opinion of yourself. You can still feel accomplished. You can still feel your career is valuable. You can still feel like a winner when you beat your siblings. You also get that from the rest of society who rightfully glorifies people doing altruistic careers. This case is uncomparative. I don't think it is. Firstly, I'm not entirely necessarily sure that the uh, point about having an excessively high opinion of yourself, that's A, not in the info slide. I think you just probably just made that up. Uh, and I don't think that's why that's true in its entirety. I think necessarily when we're talking about any sort of emotion, like happiness, happiness encompasses a wide range of someone from feeling like over the moon of the fact that they won the Olympics to me feeling slightly happy because I woke up on time in the morning. I think when we're talking about any sort of emotion, we need to talk about the entire spectrum of that emotion and not limit the debate to a small spectrum of extremes of that emotion. Uh, I think that's unfairly narrowing the debate uh, and, pr and probably means that our case actually is comparative. Uh, but I, I think that reaching for any larger societal impact is just incredibly speculative. But I think that talking about the pride that you feel in the every everyday average things that you do, the thing, the the community garden that you volunteer just because it makes your community a better place, the things that you do that are good, caring for your elderly parents, doing the job you do and having pride in the idea that you're making a difference in the world and having a good impact and having pride in that and believing that you're having that good impact when you go home at night is just incredibly important uh, and, and very easy to say that is the most important impact in this debate. Thank you, LO. Call on DPM. So I'm just going to ask if I can for um... PLIs just out loud. Thank you. I think the first thing I'm going to do is start with a response to our case. I think Henny tells you that the people who feel pride majority of the time are the people who are the most well off, the people who are the most privileged, right? I think the leader of opposition then tells us that ah, there are more social narratives that exist to still tap into that negative pride, right? And I'd like to note, so while other narratives do exist on both sides of the house, these are narratives that are external to you. E.g., there are narratives that, tell, that, that are other people telling you, hey, you're a man, you're a boss, you're a C CEO, and you should demand a raise. What's the problem with pride, right? I think is that pride is an, a narrative that is internal to you that exists. This is like a very like philosophical case, right? But it, it's like a little bit bullshitty, right? Because what's the difference between an, an internal and an external narrative, right? I think you feel it much more strongly and you weigh, more, you weigh much more high, highly. Why is that? Because you're the most proximate person to yourself, but also because you have buzzword epistemic access. You know yourself better than anyone else, but you also feel that because you're the only one who truly knows yourself, the only person who can make a judgment, therefore what you say in relation to yourself should be absolutely true. This means that comparatively, this means that privileged rich people feel even more entrenched in their belief that there is something inherently valuable about them, that there's something good about them, right? And this pride is oftentimes attached to things like their race, their class, which leads them to constantly pushing discriminatory things to further confirm their beliefs because they believe that a, they believe that they are inherently better than other people. This looks like things, for example, like rich people voting in other politicians who want low tax because they as a wealthy per per people are inherently more deserving and more entitled to making an, like, an observer, like so much 
income versus like the lower class people having like a like simple basic standard of living. What's the comparative, I think, in a world without pride, right? Because I think you still hear all the external narratives that we talk about that Henny tells you, right? But I think what the difference is, is that there are a lot of conflictive narratives that constantly exist, even if you're a rich people, in case, you know, like, they're like, ah, yes, the rich people live in a vacuum. I think this is oftentimes just due to, well, like, structurally true, just due to globalization, which means most people own a phone that has, like, that different and very complex algorithms, and oftentimes algorithms work in a way where they want to show you something that, like, will make you angry, so they show you beliefs that are different to your own, because they want to, like, get you to click, or they want to get you to react, even if it's you hatefully commenting, oh, I don't agree with this, right? What do I think this means, right? I think it means that at some point in our side of the house, rich, rich people were like exposed to a lot of narratives. So some of the narratives say that, hey, you're better than most people. Some of the narratives say, hey, you're not better than most people, right? I think that, that what does that mean? I think privileged people ultimately are casted a shadow of a shadow of a doubt and I feel like in a world where pride doesn't exist and it's not so easy for them to tap into the internal narrative that is pride that is so like oh is so like self-confirming I think it just means that like oh they actually do in in introspective in themselves they aren't so entrenched they don't actually go out doing all the bad things I told you like oh voting in pot like really like bad politicians and actively trying to like upkeep oppressive systems into the same like oh in, in the same way that they would have prior to the on their side of the house what do I think we what else do I think we hear from oh well right I think they tell you that ah pride fulfills the feedback of self-actualization right they tell you that how how do they how do they say this right they tell you that pride helps you achieve things the mechanism for this is that they say you feel that the thing you have done is good and the, and, and the, then they say there's like there's a whole impact about how we don't get charity work on, like on our side of the house i like to note this is a gross mischaracterization of what pride is pride means that when you do something you feel like you're a good person not only that you're a good person but you're such a good person that you're better than others even if you don't feel better than everyone you feel better than some people you probably feel better than the average person because no it means a, a high an inflated sense of self a high ego right if you have a significance that is better than than anyone or the other like uh, anyone or the other average person in our side when you do something note because emotions still exist like pleasure and happiness you still feel good right so in my side of the house i feel good that i served in a soup kitchen but i don't feel good that i served in a, in a soup kitchen because i'm a great person or because i'm the most selfless human being like what happens on opposition side rather i feel good that i served in a soup kitchen for the action's sake because it was a, it was a good thing for me to do like oh and it has nothing to do with my identity or my inherent value as a human being right how good i feel is based on my action is based off me completing the action alone and because of the action itself is enjoyable so i will still continue doing it i will still reach that self-actualization that self-actualization loop that like oh opposition talk about but i also think as well in opposition's world every time i do an action i'm always i'm always concerned with improving my own status which centers me around the action if they think charity is so important i just don't think you're as good like you're you're as careful when you're as careful when you're doing charity you're constantly thinking about yourself and how this affects your own status and you're doing it to stroke your own ego i think on our side of the house you focus on the action independent of what it says about you so i think this means that if they care about soup kitchens next time you're in a soup kitchen you make the extra effort to talk to like oh talk to that one person to talk about one thing because you're constantly you're constantly interested in improving the action itself versus on their side of the house you're constantly just you're just in the soup kitchen either way you don't really care too much about being it and you're just doing there to prove that you're a good person but i think it's what the what does this mean i think this means largely for like a lot of OO's case we can still claim a lot of their benefits and it probably isn't symmetric so we still get to have all the good impact that they talk about while having none of the harms that he talks about before i go on i'll take a POI from closing if they have one if not i'll take one from opening yeah, so why are people uh, just structurally unable to redefine like society standards for themselves and feel prideful about the expectations they set for themselves? Um, I think I t I think Henny tells you because you like you hear so many like shit things. So for example, I think it means that in society you're told, oh, you should feel proud for doing things that are seen as stereotypically good traits. So it means things like, for example, if you're a black person, black hairstyles like dreadlocks aren't seen as being professional, so you don't feel pride for wearing dreadlocks. That's something you can't access due to mainstream narratives that currently exist. So I think like and then like like cross apply this across any other like oh any other marginalized group, even though this was just like one example because it's a POI. What's so bad about the emotion of pride? I think Henny tells you pride is an overwhelming feedback loop. It's super. It's super. It's super negative, right? Right? I think it's it's also something that oftentimes replaces other emotions that exist, like happiness. This is a positive emotion that still builds your self esteem and identity independent of external factors. AKA, I'm happy I made this cake for my friend because it, it like I'm happy I made this cake for my friend because like I baked a cake versus I'm proud I made this cake for my friend. I am the best baker. I am the best friend. I am better than all the other people that are their friends. I am better than all the other people who didn't make cakes. Right? I think the impact and the problem with pride is the overinflated ego means that it means that I believe that I'm the best at everything I do. Why is this actually a bad thing, right? I think it's because uh, it's ultimately you aren't, right? I think if I believe I'm the best at everything I do, for example, I'm the best debater, you might inevitably come against a really strong team, like the Vani twins, right? And your whole world collapses because you come against them and you get a fourth, right? Because I, I think, what does this mean, right? I think this means that, ah, you can no longer be a 
be a debater because fundamentally there's been a shift in your identity because if you believe you're the best at something or you're better than the average person insofar as you see anything that challenges that insofar as the minute you lose the minute you scrape the minute you get a second not a first i think it means that you no longer engage in debating you don't you don't enjoy that activity anymore why because your whole enjoyment and the fact that you were doing that activity was based off yourself was based off your status was based off your importance was based off it confirming the belief that you were the best and you were better than everyone else and then insofar as that you get any piece of evidence to suggest that you aren't i guess these are just so much shame right because they, they say ah yes Shame is really bad, but I think pride inevitably leads to it leads you to a constant cycle of shame insofar as the, the minute you feel self-doubt and a fractured identity. But note the intensity of this impact, right? As this compounds over time, every single day as this doubt continues to grow, because it's like such it's such a like, oh, it's such a cognitive dis dissonance from my self-belief from what society has said, right? I think this ultimately means that this goes this comfort grows, leading to isolation and the inability to engage at all. On scale, this is super massive, and lots of people feel this. So for this reason, we're like happy to propose this notion. Thank you, PM. Call on the other. Hi, uh, for P wise, I'll call on you, but also feel free to interrupt. The primary case which we get from OG is that minorities cannot feel pride as much as majorities because society locks them out from having a high opinion about themselves as much. Two things on this. First, that this is, by and large, the narratives which construct this type of thing, the same. Racism still exists. Sexism still exists. Homophobia still exists. The emotion then, to consider, the emotion of pride in those majority instances is not always validated, is the second thing I'd say. What that means is, in our world, in op, we have the emergence of counter-narratives. Two important ones, which I might explain later. The first in that pride is a sin. That is being something that you should not always consider to be a good emotion, something which you should sometimes suppress, especially in excess. But secondly, narratives like gay pride. No, I think it's no coincidence that gay pride is much more accepted than straight pride, because there are forms of which you are asked as an individual to minimize and diminish the extent to which you feel pride within yourself, but that is less so if you are someone who is deserving of pride. I think there is a trajectory which can be observed within society then to say that the people who are more deserving of pride are those minorities in particular. But I think beyond all this, compare the I think beyond just the calculation of whether minorities or majorities feel pride more, I actually think is irrelevant because it's an insufficient reason to prefer a counterfactual world because the purpose of an emotion is not to compare that emotion to how much of an emotion another person feels. In fact, this is a task which is impossible to do. You would have to be a mind reader. It's not this. To use this as a justification to eliminate pride as an emotion would be a justification to eliminate all positive emotions. It would be a justification to eliminate happiness as an emotion if majority groups feel happiness more than minority groups. What we contend then is even if a majority group feels pride more, this is not a reason to deprive this happiness from those people, even if they feel it more so. The reason for this is because of the proximity of emotional internalization. This is a bunch of long words to say that you feel things within yourself. You don't compare yourself to others when you feel pride, when you feel self-important. This is because you feel self-important in yourself. I don't think the average person views this as a zero sum. But even if the, the final calculation to make on this is if this this motion results in like negative five utils for black people and negative 10 utils for white people in the world in which white people feel pride so much more than black people what we tell you is the equalization matters so much less than the gross loss of happiness which occurs because you're locking people out of actualizing themselves in this way. Even if their frame on minority-majority discrepancy is true, don't make people unhappy. Second thing to comment in this speech is that is a response in the idea that pride spirals in a way that makes you feel entitled, which removes true happiness. DPM says you would otherwise focus on the action itself, but what we contend is that the external is nothing without the ego. That is, 
OG do not get the ability to destroy the human will, the human idea of significance. They just deprive them of a vector to accomplish this. What this means is people who will still continue to innately desire significance are no longer able to feel that way. The response is that you just feel happy for other people. But what I think is you are unable to relate to other people as much because you have less of a conception of the ego itself because you don't know what it's like to feel important. Therefore, you wouldn't know what it's like for another person to feel important. Therefore, why would you do something that makes them feel important? You don't act in this way because you could not conceptualize it in to begin begin with in yourself. Society is now an atomized feeling. You are an individual within a world, but you don't know how to feel like an individual. You are less empathetic, hence, for that reason. Let's talk in response to this CGPY in depth that you can still feel accomplished. Pride is excessively high, opt or excessively high uh, like pride. Um, we can expand now on the counter narratives that I mentioned earlier. Societies which emerge don't want a preponderance of people with excesses of pride. There's a, main, a couple of main reasons for this. The first is that cooperation builds society stronger. If you are to have people with excess of pride, then they're going to cooperate less because they think they are too significant to cooperate with other people. Therefore, we have tools like religion and coercion to tell people that actually do not feel this amount of pride, only feel so much pride. Therefore, you're able to have the happiness without the excess. Therefore, excesses are things which would make society function less well because people don't work with each other as much. You can't build as much cool shit. You can't house as many people. Therefore, the societies which thrive are the ones which limit and curtail the bad, but enable the good. What we're left with is then Jack's case, but if CG have another POI, I'll take it now. OG. Yeah, this assumes that, yeah, it's right, CG. Yeah, this assumes that, like, the reason people feel pride is purely due to the society. But if pride is something in the human condition where we just overestimate our ability of ourself, then this still occurs regardless of whether it's in society's interest to have that emotion. So yeah, pride is something which you feel internally. It's just society is the thing which curtails and shapes the extent to which how much of it you feel. Do you feel bad when you feel too prideful? And that is a thing which as a society we've been able to happen. And we and we lock that in different groups to different extent, which is why, as I said earlier, feeling gay pride is not as scorned on as feeling straight pride. But let's uh let's then talk about why it's important how you feel more so than how you act. This implicitly responds to OG's final stuff about how you become less complacent in the way you act and you do more stuff. I just think that matters less because it's less certain. Because how you feel is always paramount in emotion about emotion, meaning the way, it, because it's the first thing that you feel, because it is a precondition to acting, meaning that in order to do something, you must have felt a way in order to do that action. Therefore, the thing which you're left with in this debate, the most comparative thing which Jack demonstrates to you, is a crucial piece of the puzzle to feeling like a complete person, to feeling like an accomplished person, and to feeling like a person who has lived a complete life, is the ability to be on your deathbed, have a high opinion of yourself, and say, I have done something in my life which mattered. And that matters more so than anything about anything that's going to result in the way which you behave because it, it, because it just matters more. Thank DLO. Call on member of GUP. All right. Um, but, 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 am I audible and visible? Oh, can everyone hear me? Awesome. I want to do a scientific examination of what pride actually is, because I still think it's incredibly vague at the end of the debate. I think there are two aspects of pride that you ought to understand. Number one, it's about expectations for yourself, the ideal that you strive to. These can either be self-imposed, for example, the ideal that I should be a fantastic debater, they can be externally imposed by patriarchy, by sexism, by heteronormativity, etc. And the second aspect of pride is whether or not you believe that you meet those expectations, that those ideals that you set for yourself. 
yourself, right? That you are hot, that you are smart, that you are talented. The deadlock that has happened in top half, and to some extent CG as well, is that it's unclear whether people have the structural ability to meet those expectations or believe they meet those expectations on either side of the house, right? That when they are met with the distinction of the gulf between ideals and reality, whether or not they're going to feel incredibly demotivated and feel lots of shame, or like as OO would say, feel super motivated and constantly want to strive. We're going to break this deadlock. First, I want to address CG. So I think I'm just going to outweigh them. I just don't think widespread Delulu is that big of a social problem that it breaks down social links. The, it's quite telling that the only examples they have is like 2% of the population, which is like a king or something. And I think those probably still exist on their side of the house. The reason why kings were so Delulu is because people were constantly feeding them compliments and incorrect inf information in order to feed their egos, right? So because of this, it's likely they're going to make wrong assessments anyway. Uh, but I want to deal with OG because I think it that tackles the main conflict of the debate. They say oppressed people are constantly locked out of the feeling of pride. But look at my definition, right? That it's it, the interaction between expectations and your perception of reality. Without pride, you still live in a world where you constantly fall short. Uh, for the structural reasons that OG themselves gives us, there are really, really high standards set for oppressed people all the time. That to, in order to be valuable as a woman, you have to be unrealistically skinny and unrealistically hot. So OG gave themselves the reasons about why these are always artificially set high for the most oppressed people. Uh, so note that this is symmetric on both sides of the house. The only comparative is that people are now very accurately aware of how they always fall, fall short of the expectations that society sets for them. The marginal impact that I may be able to achieve is that you don't feel envy that other people are able to achieve pride, but the counterfactual note that it's not that you feel satisfaction now, because note that you are unable to feel satisfied because you're constantly falling short of the expectations the society sets for you and that you adopt yourself. Like I'm unable to feel satisfied as a woman if the only source of meaning for me is to be hot and I am objectively not hot, right? So note that also the converse is true. White men are probably going to feel very satisfied because the expectation that society has for them is the bare fucking minimum. So it's probably the satisfaction the outline as the counterfactual is also inaccessible to oppressed people and overly accessible to those who are very privileged. On our side, I think the basic thing is just like, look, at least we have people who are delulu enough to believe that they fulfill the unrealistic expectations the society sets for them. For example, look at me walking around thinking that I am very beautiful. The assumption, I think, that's also like a critical assumption that I think OG makes, uh, and it's how we're going to place above them in the debate, which is that there, there's an assumption that expectations are rigid and they can only be externally imposed. This is where my extension comes in. I think it is on our side that we get the questioning of this patriarchal heteronormative and racist standards uh so the compare so i think when you're always hyper aware of that how you are always falling short these super rigid super artificially high standards uh, on their side of the house this creates a negative feedback loop right you no longer have self-worth because you're constantly falling short of these super high expectations and because of that you don't have any confidence to assert yourself on the public sphere because you don't believe that you are deserving of taking taking up space and that you don't believe that your voice ought to be heard. Uh, shame, which they conceded still exists on their side of the house, overwhelms any feeling of, for example, ethical wrongdoing and injustice that I think that they, that still exists on both sides of the house. And because of that, they never really choose to critique the standards they are set to versus on our side of the house. It's necessary to have the reward mechanism, reward mechanism of pride when people choose to critique the standards that are set upon them. Uh, people constantly feel like shit if they are constantly falling short of the expectations that society like sets upon them, but they want to feel really good, right? Note that pride is a very powerful feeling. Uh, it's a very powerful positive feeling because it is literally fantasy and idealism realized, feeling that you are everything that you ought to be. So when you people get that dopamine hit, hit of critiquing the standards that society sets for them and set their own standards for excellence instead, that's when we give them that dopamine hit, right? So for like a really classic illustration is when people critique the standards of beauty that society sets upon them. When people do the mental work of redefining what beauty ought to mean, then they see those qualities within themselves 
they get that really powerful dopamine hit of, you know, like pride that we, we are only able to access on our side of the house. Note that pride is necessary to overcome the shame barrier, right? Um, the shame barrier because it is the only reward mechanism that we have for people questioning the ideologies that they are normalized to. Before I go on, OG. Why would racism and sexism exist in a world without pride when there is no inherent value of one human characteristic over another? This is a this house prefers a world motion. Oh, come on, man. Like, we both know why, like, racism and sexism is going to exist. There are very material reasons why white people like to oppress Black people and like to oppress women. They can extract huge amounts of infinite labor upon us that they don't have to compensate us for if they have racist and sexist societies. There are just material reasons why they want to keep people down. And ideology, like sexism and patriarchy, are set up to justify those material inequalities. So going on then, uh, back to people overcoming that shame barrier. So when people do the mental work and actually uh, are able to overcome that shame barrier, we are the ones that reward them for doing so. Note that this then creates a virtuous cycle, right? When you feel pride within yourself and you are confident, you are able to assert yourself on the public sphere. You are able to then participate in the public arena where you argue with like oppressive society. Their standards are the ones that are incorrect because you have confidence in yourself and you have confidence in your self-importance. Note that like an illustration of this is, for example, queer pride. When people People felt pride in their own identities and they had a huge amount of self-importance, which is kind of like which was at that time a little bit delusional. They were able to assert themselves and fight against heteronormative society. Uh, so uh, on the counterfactual, when you only have quote unquote scientifically accurate assessments of you know your performance, note this performance is always going to be done under the rules of an oppressive society. It is only on our side to reward people for redefining what those rules ought to be. For all those reasons, side we Take member up. Call on Gavit. Uh, yeah. Can I just ask the recording is turned off, please? Take that as a sign. Okay. Cool. Do we have OG here? OG. Okay. We don't have OG. Uh, oh well. Hi. CG? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then CO? Yeah. Okay, one more time. Is OG here? Sorry, OG is here. Yes. Perfect. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Starting now. Uh, result for the round. First to closing opposition. Second to opening opposition. Third to closing government. Fourth to opening government. So uh, let's start with the top half and uh, then bring in the closing teams. To begin uh, in the front half. So I think that there's uh, a core set of arguments from opening government um, that have to do with A, reasons why uh, pride is unequally distributed and therefore the way that narratives shaping pride stratify in society. In short, it is harder for a variety of reasonably good, well-analyzed descriptions uh, for certain people to feel pride because there are a lot of reasons that uh, you know, just basic racism, um, colorism, lack of respect for gender, as illustrated, that mean that some people don't have access to pride. And then there's unique harms that come from others feeling more pride and demonstrating their pride that you don't have access to. Second, some reasons, even though I don't think that they're as well analyzed as they could be, uh, about why people become um, egotistical, they don't self-improve, they feel better about themselves and don't sufficiently question their decisions when they have too high a status of themselves. Um, I think that this second part is the part that ends up being more vulnerable to criticism from OO um, in that I think too much of the analysis is superficial uh, in terms of justifying why people are excessively prideful or simplistic. So the idea that, you know, when you lose a debate, you know, your, your pride is challenged and therefore you lose, um, at least on face, even before we get to the responses that we end up getting from opening opposition, is quite simplistic. Um, it doesn't super clearly characterize the reasons why pride is so uh, malleable and not sufficiently strong, but also so strong um, that it causes people to be really excessive and and, and not to, to um, uh, be challenged and so on. So I felt on face that the characterization of pride is a bit confusing uh, from, from opening government, both in terms of how strong the pride is and be in terms of um, how likely that pride is to make you uh, do the wrong decisions. In terms of how opening up actually engages with that claim, so first, they have a lot of mitigation. And I think that this is the first pitfall that opening gov falls into, 
um, which is that the motion is not um, about a narrative uh, that people ought feel pride, but the burden on government is actually stronger. It's that they not feel the emotion of pride altogether. And so OO, honestly, you know, is inaccurate themselves when they say that these are countervailing narratives that they're discussing. They're not even countervailing. They're just engaging in a debate about how pride manifests and how pride is interpreted by society because they're, you know, their burden is even easier than, than they're, they're even selling themselves. And so I do think that they provide, at least out of the LO, um, insufficient reasons about why these narratives are strong, just that they exist, um, and some indication that social movements can weaponize pride. At least in the LO, that wasn't enough to get me to believe that that countervailing narrative is, is sufficiently strong. In DLO, we do get more uh, on this. We get some reasons to believe um, that, you know, there's an idea that too much pride is sinful, uh, or the idea that, um, you know, like gay pride can be strong because it weaponizes the strength of those emotions and that there's some expectation as society liberalizes that you minimize the extent of your pride if you're the majority. They do not unfortunately prove here that this is likely to be the case in a number, a significant number of instances. That is the claim begins from the perspective that society has liberalized on some level and therefore expectations of pride have shifted. This will become relevant later for what CO adds, but I just want to point out that it, it's sufficient relative to OG, I think, because it applies in some number of cases, but not enough. Um, but it's not perfect on its own. What they do supply, though, and this is the biggest place where they beat opening government, is a very, very strong argument about the way that people feel about themselves, the self-actualization. I think that, that occurs on two levels. Number one is sort of the dopamine that people feel at not floating through, you know, floating through the universe, but rather having a lot of self-centeredness and a, a, be a belief in a core narrative about their life. But also a very interesting argument that neither opening government nor closing government do a particularly good job of responding to, um, which is that when people are motivated by pride, they feel a pressure to earn that pride legitimately. That That is the board game example, basically. Um, you feel the pride because you play by the rules, which also implicitly clashes with the arguments made by both opening gov and closing gov, that the people who are likely to feel the pride are people who have unearned pride due to power, um, but rather some idea that pride requires you to believe that you've earned that pride. Now, will that occur in the majority of cases? I'm not entirely sure. I don't think OO gives me enough reasons to believe that's the majority of cases, but at the very least, it mitigates the extent of the argument that's being made by opening government here that the wrong people uh, have pride accrue to them. And I do think that there are some clear impacts that result from this claim. So the soup kitchen example, that if you feel pride in what you're doing, then you're more likely to do things that have fewer intrinsic rewards. Opening government responds and says, well, this does have intrinsic rewards. You feel good about the action. But it's not actually clear that the, you know, the, the feeling good about the action in this case is proportionate to the level of you know, benefit that you produce and people that you help or comparatively powerful next to the other things that you could do, like, I don't know, make a lot of money. Um, that would make you feel like you're doing even more to benefit yourself. So I do think that the example stands from opening up. Um, I think what I take away at the end of the top half is there's some reasons provided by opening government that privileged people entrench pride and feel better about themselves unjustly, and some reasons to believe that people don't, don't sufficiently improve, like their cake baking skills, their friendship skills, etc. I think always weighing here is sufficient, though, when they point out that, A, the leveling down argument, basically, that um, even if o OG gets some equalization, the extent of the harm they cause to people emotionally is much larger. And second, some reason to believe that the like failure to upgrade skills and stuff um, actually isn't as powerful with the description towards the end of the DLO about how societies don't want excess pride. They have cooperation, they have religion. And I think the POI response to CG is effective here. That you know, pride is in the human, uh, you know, pride is in the human condition. Yes, but society curtails it to a degree. So I believe that the extent of OG's unique impacts on being a worse friend or not self improving are just less powerful, and this allows most of, but not all, the opening up uh, arguments to flow in terms of people feeling better about themselves, less atomized, more individually um, centered, and the emotional benefits that flow uh, from that happiness. Bringing in closing gut. I think closing gov provides uh, two unique things on top of opening government, which uh, do eventually allow them to beat out over opening government. So one, I think they provide more realistic and accurate impacting about the likely results of feeling too much pride. OG does this somewhat abstractly. So OG talks about not self-improving because you already feel sufficiently good about yourself, but the specificity there and the realism of that claim that I've already flagged has some issues on face even prior to OO engagement. What CG does is they first explain larger impact cases, like in terms of political leaders or in terms of corporate leaders or even in terms of deep friendships, where excess pride causes people to either respond insufficiently to criticism because they insulate themselves from that criticism and the stakes of accepting that criticism hurt their pride more, 
um, and B, reasons why it causes them to listen to others less and be less empathetic towards others, which is bad for society for reasons they illustrate in terms of like less confident management, less good political leadership, less depth of friendship because people get mad at each other disproportionately and so on. Um, the second thing that they provide, and I think that this ends up being especially important for them relative to, to OG, um, is they provide way better responses to the comparative that's being built up by both OO and eventually CO in terms of how people feel uh, absent pride. So one, they explain that even without pride, you can still have, you know, the, the, the idea that you shouldn't be slighted, that everyone has some baseline right as supplied in the width, actually is reasonably powerful to point out why people still feel um, self-worth and also a desire to change things about themselves uh, and improve themselves. This goes beyond OG saying, well, you feel some benefit from working in the soup kitchen um, and ex explains in more detail in terms of where it comes from. Um, but second, they also provide quite good weighing for the gov side overall, which is like, uh, again, with negative reasons tend to keep in your mind, the hedonic treadmill undermines some of the benefits of happiness um, that we're getting from OO. And I think that even for a member, uh, you know, even before the direct engagement, there is some good implicit weighing um, about why um, OO isn't fully comparative in ways that OG doesn't do. Um, you know, accurate opinions can be genuinely reflective of, of the work you do. Um, so basically better illustration uh, of why in a, you know, some preponderance of cases, the things that we do that are socially utile result in accurate judgments by people uh, uh, about whether or not they're, they're utile, which I think goes beyond the assertion from OG just very slightly. The biggest thing I'm weighing from, uh, from CG over OG though, is the extent of the impact, much clearer, uh, much, much clearer impacting and slightly different mechanisms as well. Um, so it's not just extending on the, on, on the same mechanism um, about why people actually feel insulted by pride, why they value it so much, why that causes them to be quite blind to other people's criticisms in much more detail than is done uh, by opening up. How did that engage uh, with opening off? I, I thought about this for a while because if you on face believe a lot of the CG extension and you believe some, but not all, but at least most of the response made in, in GovWith, then you can really think about the way that interacts um, with the best case version uh, of OO. That is, if I believe from closing government that people have very fragile egos, and second of all, I believe that it's sufficient for social change or self-improvement or pride to just feel that you have some basic human dignity, then it gets quite close between CG and OO. And to a degree, I'm crediting the CG material here. I don't, however, feel that the direct response to the most important material from OO is sufficient from CG. In particular, there's not a lot of weighing. I mean, there's this abstract weighing at the end of GovWhip that like happiness is less important because hedonic treadmill, which I just don't think is well enough explained next to the depth of the analysis uh, of OO to weigh over them. And there's also not a lot of explicit rebuttal to the argument that I mentioned earlier from OO about wanting to feel pride and legitimate accomplishments. And I'm not sure if CG gets to accomplish that too from people in the less developed claim about pride, uh, that it's possible to use pride for social change, to me is not being effectively responded to by closing Gov when they explain that it's sufficient to just say that you have like baseline dignity. I don't think that ends up being sufficient relative to CO, which is what it's actually in response to, but transitively it's responding as well to the version of the claim um, made by OO. It doesn't seem realistic that in order to get people to make sacrifices or really change themselves, that feeling just like a very moderate version of the narrative is sufficient, or if it is, it would need much more explanation, which wasn't done. Um, it was more of a defensive response, which was done quite quickly. So in the end, I believe CG's impacts. I believe people that are, you know, people are slightly worse off in terms of their friendships, that maybe leaders in some cases are too prideful. Um, I do think that OO mitigates that with some of their counter narratives analysis, which CG doesn't effectively respond enough to about why people get called out for being too prideful, et cetera. It applies in some cases. I don't think it applies in enough cases to outweigh uh, opening off. Bringing closing off. Two main contributions from closing off. Uh, number one, um, I, I think they, they focus maybe a bit too much on like what they're doing about the definition. Uh, of expectations, because I believe at this point, OO has at least done some uh, of this. But what they do is that they give a much, much deeper version of analysis, uh, of the analysis from OO uh, about how social change happens and how pride actually insulates people from uh, negative outcomes during the time that they live. And that actually, I, I should mention it now before I forget, interacts quite well with the closing government argument that, you know, if people feel really bad about themselves, they'll act for social change as well. Because that response is somewhat powerful, as I mentioned, against opening off, that like maybe th there's some social change because people feel bad about themselves and believe that they get dignity. But CO access is a higher impact here when, when they argue that people can feel happier in the interim because they can redefine their expectations 
of um, what it means to be prideful around to an extent, I guess, around their own objectives and their own expectations for themselves. And so even if CG gets some social progress too, Theo achieves that social progress while people feel substantially happier and more dignified about themselves. And I think that they fairly well illustrate the ways that people can redefine um, uh, themselves, redefine their definition of pride. One criticism perhaps is that they need to do somewhat work, more work to prove that this is likely. They do get a POI to wit, for, for example, from opening gov that says, um, will, you know, if racism is so powerful and so on, will people actually be able to redefine? I think that there's a somewhat compelling response, both implicitly in member and in the actual POI response, that, you know, it's, it's possible to do this as long as you have baseline confidence, because eventually it feels so bad to get the shame that you, you really want to redefine away. Um, so that is stronger analysis than OO already, even though it's not perfect. The second is pretty good impacting about why this actually does lead uh, to, to social change. Um, it's very powerful. It's a very powerful reward, reward mechanism for groups to fight for themselves. Um, eventually, it has some discursive effect uh, in public because, you know, LGBT movements can use it and so on. And people are just encouraged to keep fighting for their rights because the reward mechanism is very strong. Um, and then they also provide pretty good reasons beyond what OO did about why racism and sexism as a, as a baseline still end up existing, for instance, in the POI response uh, in member. Why does this weigh over OO? I think one, um, OO is to a degree uh, reliant, at least implicitly, on the idea that people have good mechanisms for pride to access happiness. If you live in a society which tells you that you shouldn't feel prideful, as OG says, um, and then you don't access that benefit, um, that's bad because you haven't redefined pride in the right ways. I think OO did enough relative to OG. OG here to at least draw that theme close, but not enough to conclusively prove the claim for, for off bench. I do think closing off does here. Second, I think that there's realistic impacting of the degree of social change, even though relative to closing off, for example, closing off questions and says like, how much social change will you get? Will it happen? It won't happen immediately. I do believe it happens eventually. Um, and I think that's consistent with the analysis advanced, advanced even prior to the closing gov response, which is that you keep getting that feedback loop, even if you don't succeed originally at redefining pride. And you can do this internally within your own locus of control, because it's about the difference between reality um, and your own expectations. So I do believe that's sufficient to weigh over uh, OO, even though OO has a pretty significant impact of individual happiness. Um, I think that CEO actually gets a stronger individual happiness uh, margin when they prove that in the process of achieving social change, you can still redefine pride to feel good about that, to feel intrinsically good about yourself, and that you deserve, you know, dignity and self-confidence and so on. Um, and they also correctly make it apply even for people who don't intrinsically have like a lot of beauty or intelligence because they redefine their expectations next to that, which is not analysis that was supplied by OL. Why does it beat CG? I think A, in terms of direct response, they do a fair bit of work to actually mitigate the CG argument, show that the number of cases where it would apply where there's like excess ego in terms of power are at least limited. I don't love the response in MO that like kings are 2% of the population because they do happen to be very important parts of the population. I think this response wouldn't work next to a better version of the closing government case, which unfortunately doesn't exist, um, which is like more clearly tying pride to nationalism and political conflict. I think it's just the, the impacting of the likelihood of, you know, war or excess pride in political leaders just isn't quite connected enough in terms of the analytical depth from CG to make it super damaging. Um, but second, there is some good response as well in um, uh, Oplip to explain that um, uh, like there are countervailing actions against being bad towards your friends, that you can take pride in other things that aren't connected to like what the king or the people in power will want. So I just think between the direct response and the fact that the scope of the extension on social change does seem implicitly bigger than um, leaders are bad, because the impacting of leaders are bad is just a bit too abstract, uh, I lean towards closing off here. Uh, they mostly beat OG, to be frankly, transitively, because the CG case is already a better analyzed version of a lot of the content from OG. But they also have two good POI, or sorry, what the one good POI response uh, to OG. Um, and pretty good response as well to the remaining uh, OG argument about um, the reasons why in the absence of pride, there'll still be countervailing norms of racism and people access pride unequally because their whole extension explains why people who have less social power can still redefine their metrics of pride um, and therefore why it's not true that we have this stratified outcome of pride that OG characterized. Good debate, everyone. Thank you. If you have any questions, let me know. 